Good evening, friends. It's indeed a great privilege to be in the midst of such a fine group of people on this Saturday night. I'm thinking, as Brother Sherrick was bringing me down tonight, of how many places the people are in, uh, evil places of drinking and carrying on tonight, but it goes to show that God has people everywhere. They crowd out to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ their love. And I'm so thankful for you. And I'm here tonight to try to help you to have a solid faith in Jesus Christ. By the gift of the divine the gift coming from God, which was given to me by allotted by grace of the Lord to manifest Jesus Christ to you in his love. And that's why I'm here tonight. To help you, to believe on you. Now the brethren is telling me to be sure to remember the handkerchief each night to pray over the handkerchief. That's a great ministry of its own, praying over a handkerchief. I send, I guess, around a thousand a week to different parts of the world. It certainly has great results. Thousands and thousands of healings come from laying on a cross. It's just as scripture is laying on hand. It's a, we send them all over the world. And now, Many ministers I know today, and I, maybe some of them are sitting present, has great radio broadcasts and so forth, and they say to people, write to me, we want to hear from you, just to get your address, to mail, put mail to you. Well now, or mail you. But friends, I'm not saying this for that. I, it's hard for me to get letters to the people, you see. And, but I, if you need a prayer call and you don't get it here, just write me at my home address, and I, I'll send it to you. And I'll assure you, you won't be plagued with cards and mail, <laughs> to, because I don't have a broadcast to support. I work real closely. I don't have any great thing expensive. I don't get big expensive buildings. I try to keep the work just as humble, just as cheap. I don't try to go to big places. I, I just try to be just like the people that comes to me. See, of course, if we'd set it out in great big advertisement for a year ahead of time and get every church in the country and all and swear up and down we wouldn't come unless everybody would cooperate, we'd probably start off with eight, ten thousand 10,000 people or more, 15. But I, I can't do mine that way. I just I have to do just as he tells me. And if he says, go down here, there's four or five down here, I just as soon go, I'd rather go to four or five knowing he sent me there than to go to 100,000 knowing that he didn't send me there. And, and I, my congregations and so forth is not as, as strong or as many as many of the brothers or who are on the field today, but I don't have, I don't have the advertisement out like the rest of the brothers do. Another thing, I don't have the cooperation as other brothers do. And uh, because I'm interdenominational and I have no church to back me up, just the friends of Jesus Christ is all I have. That's all, that's all I have. And here some time ago, a very famous evangelist in the nation who attracts literally tens of thousands to his meeting, one of my co workers was standing talking to him. He said, Well, said that I won't go to a city unless all the radius around and every church will close and have the meetings. You think some man would come to Louisville, Kentucky? There's 400 Baptist churches alone in Louisville. 400 churches, and it's not a Baptist town. Asbury College is just beyond me. It's a Methodist town, but these 400 big Baptist churches in the city of Louisville. It'd probably be a five or 600 Methodist churches. Besides Presbyterian and all the rest of them, you get a group like that together, you got some people to start with. But no disregards. That's politics. I'd rather go just where God would tell me to go if I just had to see one person. And Philip was having a big revival down to Samaria. And the Lord called him out of that and sent him over to the desert to find one man and a colored man, an Ethiopian. And he obeyed the Lord. And that's, that's the way that I think we should do it, just wherever the Lord leads. Now, maybe the Lord leads people in other ways, but 
Now, I was sure recently writing a great revival where thousands of people were gathered in. Many of you, maybe some of you is here, down here on your vacation now, is the Kellogg Auditorium and what's up in Michigan there, Battle Creek, in Battle Creek, Michigan. Is anybody there at the meeting that time? Yeah. Up at Battle Creek, Michigan, where the, oh, yes, there was someone was at that meeting. And right when the place was packed and jammed out with people, I pulled out to a lake one afternoon, a little lake, about half a mile around it, and was back there praying down in a bunch of bushes. I heard something going. <laughs> I looked up, and I just went out. I was sitting on a, a boat going down along the seashore. And the angel of the Lord come near and said, Close the meeting now. Eight more days yet to go, yes. We'll close the meeting now and turn aside to Minneapolis at once. Well, I went in and told the manager. He wouldn't believe it. He said, You tell the ministers. I said, God knows how I love ministers. They're the shepherds of the flock. But there's the master of all of us. I must listen to him. I got in trouble over that one time in Africa. You're acquainted with the story, perhaps. I said, No, I must go. Brother Baxter said, Brother Brandon, you tell the ministers. I said, well, you just get them up here. So I told them, and they, they kind of felt ill towards me. They said, the Lord told us to make this for two weeks. I said, but the Lord told me to go somewhere else. I said, uh, what the Lord told you, that's all right. But what he told me, I'll do. So I turned aside right there. Mr. Baxter said, well, I'll do it. We'll, we'll go into this week. I said, we're going right now. And now, if you want to know the results and what come out, you just write Reverend Gordon Peterson at uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and find out why it was. If when I talk on the phone, if it had been five minutes later, yes, two minutes later, there'd been something happening in Minneapolis, would have changed the history of the Pentecostal Church in Minneapolis. Now, I knew nothing about it until I got over there. And then the Lord revealed it. Go first. He'll pay you if you get there. Just rise and go. And so you must follow the leadings of the Lord. So now maybe the Lord tells people to go set their meetings and have these. That, that's all right. If he does that, just so you're minding the Lord is the main thing. Everybody has things to do differently. Now, remember tomorrow afternoon, the Lord willing, we want to speak tomorrow afternoon of fundamentalism versing full gospel and come out as many as can and it's a preaching service and I spoke on this once before at a convention and I was asked to do it again if the Lord willing I don't know but if he will and then Tomorrow evening is the last service of the Phoenix campaign, and you come early. I'll try to let you out early so he can get back. As I come on down there, Billy was standing down there and said, Daddy, when he starts singing and everything, it's hard to, to give the people their cards. One will be over here calling one over here. I said, tell them to come early, by 5.30, 6 o'clock. Get your sick out here so they can get the prayer card at 5.30. The Lord willing, he and the brethren will be giving out prayer cards here at 5.30 tomorrow afternoon, from 5.30 till about 6.30, or 6 o'clock or somewhere along there till they get the prayer card given out. So be sure to remember that. And now let's put our every effort. Tomorrow afternoon, I believe they announced that it's a missionary offering tomorrow afternoon. I never have anything to do with the money. There's been three things that I have tried to keep away from all my life. And that one thing is money. That's one of the things that ruins a minister, is money. When you get your eyes on money, you've got it off of God. Right. Brother Moore here, Brother Brown has been with him all along. And if I ever heard of anybody in my meeting ever making one pull or strain for any money or anything, just pass the collection plate. 
when the Lord won't supply my needs, then it's time for me to go home. But the Lord will supply. And if I can't trust him for, for money, how can I trust him for healing? How can I trust him for anything else? See, I've got to trust him. And so uh, we just pass the collection plate. And if we don't get enough to pay, then at the end of the service, when my campaign's over, they take up a love offering. I'm sorry they have to do that. If I had any other way of making a living, I wouldn't permit it. But I got three children and a wife and a lot of expenses. My expenses runs me about $100 a day, whether I'm preaching or whether I'm not. So at the, uh, my office affair at Jeffersonville, several worked in the office and letters and stamps and so forth, runs me about $100 a day. And uh, some of the brethren, I suppose, are, I was hearing Mr. Billy Graham just on his broadcast alone is $1,000 a minute. That's for broadcast. How about the rest of the campaign and the television? I wonder how much it costs to run that campaign. But if somebody would happen to say, well, you watch these fellows come in preaching divine healing, you're just taking their money from the people, what about that? <laughs> See? What? Good for the goose is for the gander, you know. So that's uh, that's just right. So look at that, a thousand minutes for just a broadcast. See? All right, that's perfectly all right. No criticism to that. Understand? Not a bit. The man needs it. God bless those who are helping him to do it. But just have to look at both sides of it, you know. As the man was said, that was very good, but there's some more to it. You see. So that is right. Now. Then they take up a love offering, and if for me at the last night of the service, and then if there's not enough money has come in to pay the, the campaign free, then I'll take my love offering and pay that. I'm not ask the people, the love offering does that. I've never asked one of the managers, Mr. Baxter, he gets the free will offering when he's with Brother Moore there won't take nothing. But Brother <clears throat> Baxter always taken one night's offering, that was a Saturday night. And I've never asked one of the managers here, Brother Bosworth, or any of them to, to put in one penny that's there. But I'm on offering, and my wife, which is up there in the balcony, or just coming down over there, she had said she's a witness, and if you want to come to Jeffersonville or anywhere you wish to, check it. I have never been guilty, and will not as long as God helps me, to ever use the Lord's money for anything that's not right. And Every penny of money that I get a hold of, every penny, if I'd have a love offering in it, say I'd have a, a $500 in the love offering, or $1,000 in the love offering, well, I go home to the office, if I don't need any of it in the meeting, maybe it's some left over, might run up $200 over, make say $1,200. And I go home and I ask my secretary, how much do we need? Well, you're overdrawing so much in the bank. I put that in to fill that up. Then I'll find out how much it'll be approximately to to live on to the next meeting, then what's left over that, I put it in foreign missions. That's true. And for myself, I keep nothing. And most of my clothes and things are given to me. People give it to me. We live like ordinary people. When God in heaven knows I'd be a multi-millionaire if I wanted to be. But far be it from me to ever take the gospel of Jesus Christ to commercialize it. Never in my life would I ever want to be guilty of such a thing as that. And I, I never want to be. The next thing is, one thing for a minister is money, and the next thing is immoral living, which when I was a sinner, I tried to live clean and decent. And then the next thing is popularity. Usually when God blesses a man, gives him a little ministry, he begins to think he's above everybody else. And that's just the time he's on his road out. That's right. That you never, you're no more, no matter what God has made you, and if he's give you a ministry that's so big, uh, or whatever it is, remember, we're only man. It's God, that's all, that does it. And we must keep that kind of an attitude and love the people. The Lord bless you now, and may he greatly increase your faith. Tomorrow at Sunday school, you visitors here, visit some of these good full gospel churches. Take your place there. And just like you as a member, I'm sure they'll make you feel at home everywhere. This morning at a little meeting we had, I met a fine group of people. We got together with one heart and one soul this morning. It was supposed to be a ministerial breakfast, but it was a spiritual breakfast. It was a ministerial breakfast, the right kind, the kind you don't eat at. You fast and preach the gospel. So 
In that, we had a wonderful time. He got some fine men and women here in Phoenix. God help you to be one accord. May that lovely spirit that existed in that room this morning never leave Phoenix. May it stay right with you. Then you'll see a revival break in Phoenix that there'll be nothing around here can hold it. God bless you now. And let's read some of the Word. And now I want to watch my time, allow myself about 20 to 30 minutes. It's very hot in here, and I trust that God will bless you. Now, remember the mailing address if you want a handkerchief and it doesn't get in the mail or any time. Just write me, Jeffersonville, Indiana, William Branham, and it'll, it'll come to me. And uh, the post office, Box 325, but you don't necessarily have to have that. I live in a little bitty city. It's not big as Phoenix. <laughs> and it's a little bitty place for about 20,000 people. And so just write Jeffersonville, Indiana. It'll come to me. The Lord bless you now. Before we, I might turn the pages back on this book, but there's not a man on earth or nowhere outside of the Holy Spirit that's able to interpret this word. That's right. So before we try to read it, it's so spiritual and so divine, let's bow our heads and talk to the author just a moment. Kind Heavenly Father, we thank thee tonight for people who are willing to come and sit in a hot building like this and to make this sacrifice, to come and, and be inconvenienced to them and come to hear the gospel, the preaching of the gospel, and to see the power of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus convict sinners of their sins and to bring them to reconciliation to, before God. And I pray, Father, that you will bless them for this effort. Many poor, sick people sitting here tonight, suffering, heart trouble, cancers, stomach troubles, TB, all kinds of diseases and afflictions. Of course, this crowd pushed in like this, and the intense heat of the building, they're suffering as they sit here. Oh, God, may the Holy Ghost come in his great power, and like he did to the children in the, uh, the Hebrew children in the fiery furnace, and Put our minds so in condition to think upon him and to listen to his blessed word until the heat of the building will fade away and we'll not think about it, but just that the power of the Holy Spirit might renew all of our faith and strength in God. Granted, help the speaker, bless the hearer, sanctify the people, the word, and may every one of the words of God tonight fall in the right kind of a ground that would bring forth a hundredfold. Comfort the saints, Lord. They're, we're speaking so much to the sinner, calling them to repentance. Now comfort the saints also, Lord, and give them consolation to know that their faith is not in vain in the Lord Jesus, but we're moving on to that great land. Grant it, Lord, and help us and bless us, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, reading of the Word, I take my text tonight, if it would call it a text or a scripture reading, out of Genesis, the 12th chapter. And also, if you want to refer to it sometime, over to Romans, the 4th chapter, would give you just a analyzed view of what I wish to speak on, the Lord willing. And you're such a lovely group here at Phoenix. I hope that the next time that when I come back, it will not have to come for divine healing of the people. I pray that God will help me in such a way that I'll be able to come back just to teach or to preach the gospel of the Word. I've often, I was going to take this time now just for the teaching of the Word. I'm not a teacher by no means, but you don't know what a blessing it is to me to express my gratitude of Jesus Christ to an audience, how I like to adore him, and how I like to praise him before the people, 
and let the whole world as it was know what I think about him, how marvel, how wonderful he is. Now, listen to the reading. Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house into a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and I will make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now I want to take a text as this. We won't have time to go into it deep because we only have around 20 minutes, but in this time I want to hit some of the high spots speaking on the subject of the unconditional covenant that God made with his people. I'm so happy. Now we're all acquainted with the scriptures, you Bible readers. Listen close. Give me your undivided attention for a few moments. Now, God, in the, after the Andalusian destruction, when he saved the household of Noah, Noah and his sons and their wives, Noah had three sons, Ham, Japheth, and and Shem, Shem, and out of those sprung the generations of peoples that we have today. We're taught in another phase that the three wise men that came to worship Jesus, consulting one another, found out one was from the, the lineage of Ham, one from Shem and Japheth. Those three, and Jesus said, when this gospel has been preached to Ham, Shem and Japheth's people, then the end shall come. The three ancient fathers coming to pay tribute as they follow the morning star to Christ. Oh, something about the Word of God that when a man speaking of it, he trembles. And another thing, it blesses his soul in such a way it puts something in him that nothing else can do because it's the Word, the written Word, a seed that will bring forth in its season, just as God has promised it to do. Now, watch closely. Then immediately after the Andalusian destruction, God, these tribes begin to tribe off. And we notice the first time that Babylon appears. It appears in Genesis in the beginning. It appears in the middle of the scripture, the Bible, and it appears over in the end of the Bible, in Revelations. The seed, God willing, tomorrow I want to speak on that. A Babylon begins, as far as we know, with the first time Babylon was mentioned, it was connected with idolatry. And then, as we see it and notice it connected there in idolatry, the uh, tribes went to this place first. Babylon was called, I believe, I may misinterpret this word, I hope not. But it's either the gates of paradise or the gates to heaven, the first interpretation of Babylon. Then it was called confusion. And Nimrod established Babylon, which was an ancestor of Ham. And there idolatry began. Then down out of Babylon, down into Shinar, went Abraham's father. And Abram, he was Abram first, and then he taken with him Sarah, his wife, Lot, the nephew, and while down in the Shinar there, perhaps lived a peaceful life, went out probably in the morning, he picked berries and eat them, went into the bush and killed his protein, the uh, uh, food, a uh, uh, beast, and then at night eat some more berries peacefully. One day, Abraham, no more than any other man, maybe as far as we know, coming out of, of Babylon, perhaps an idolater. But God, by election, 
God does the choosing we can't choose. God does the choosing. We have nothing to do with it. Man said, Oh, brother, I sought God, I sought. No man never sought God. It's not in a man to seek God. No man at any time or any age ever sought God. It's just by subversity, it's God seeking the man, not man seeking God. Jesus said, No man can come to me except my Father draws him. Is that right? The very beginning. Man, when he fell from grace, his nature was changed. And he run from God and hid from God, and that's still his nature. A man can never seek God while he's a sinner. God has to seek man. And a man, as I was explaining to some people today, just like a pig and a lamb, well, the lamb could say to the pig, why, look, you're nothing but an old slop-eating pig. The pig could say, tend to your own business. I have no desires to be a lamb. And the pig could not change his nature. No more than a sinner can change your nature. You're born in sin, shaped in iniquity, come to the world speaking lies, and there's not one good sound part about anybody. So who are you anyhow? Sometimes I notice people go out here, I was standing by a big museum here not long ago, and I've seen the analysis of a human body. A man that weighed 150 pounds was worth 84 cents in chemicals. Could you think of it? And then you think you're somebody. You're worth 84 cents. That's right. Put a $10 hat on 84 cents and think you're somebody. Wrap a $500 chubby around you and think you're somebody when you're 84 cents. You sure take care of that 84 cents, though, don't you? That's right. But remember, in there you've got a soul that's worth 10,000 worlds. And you let the devil push that around anyway. Yes, that's right. You take a person, some of these little feisty people out on the street, don't know no more about God than a hot and pot would know about an Egyptian night. You know, they belong to church. Wrap a $500 meat coat around, stick their nose up in the air. If it rained, it would drown them, thinking there's somebody. What are the 84 cents? That's right. But you got a soul, remember. Now, in the beginning, you say to that person, you ought to be born again to say, tend to your own business, smart Ali. Can't help it. Just can't help it. It's a pig. You can never tell it to be a lamb. No more than you can ever become a Christian without God calling you. Now, what has to happen to the pig to make him want to be a lamb is something has to come down and change his being. Is that right? So who has to do that? You? Your whole nature is the other way. God has to do it. God speaks and your nature begins to seek after God. That's when God is dealing with you. Before anything can happen out here to make you be a Christian, something has to happen in the heart here to turn you to Christianity. That's right. It's an election. God does that. The father Abraham was the first one that I know of this side of the flood that was called by grace, by election. God chose Abraham not because he was Abraham, not because he was any good person. God chose him because he was elected. God did it. Now I want to say something. You can never make yourself something that you're not. If you're just impersonating Christianity, no matter if you're preaching the gospel, you need an altar call in your soul. That's right. If you're just trying to act like that person that's a Christian, you're miserable yourself knowing in your heart that you're not. And if the fruits of the Spirit don't follow you, long suffering, goodness, meekness, gentleness, patience, then you need an altar call in your heart. You just feared hell and started off trying to be a Christian. God has to call you to be a Christian. God called Abraham, give him, elected him. Now notice, 
when God calls a man, now look, not because he was better than somebody else, but because God called him. Uh, this is for Christians. Notice, then after God called him, he said, the first thing I want you to do is separate yourself. That's what God does today. Separation. Most all the churches, when they're calling their new pastors, over in a Baptist church, we used to see that. The people say, oh, that old preacher, he's old fogey. He tries to tell us this. We want a young fellow who can, who, who's a good mixer. God don't want mixers. God wants separators. Yeah. Separate yourself. That's right. God always calls for separation. Said, separate yourself from your kindreds, from your peoples, separate from your associates, separate from your habits, separate from everything, and come out and stand alone for God. Amen. That's where the first man was called by election. That's where the last man's been called to do the same thing. Separate yourself from your associates, the things of the world. Come out from among them. Be separate. He said, then I'll bless you. If you want a blessing, separate yourself from the things of the world. Notice, after he did that, Abraham, when God called him, was 75 years old. And Sarah, his wife, was 65 years old. Now, menopause sets in about 40, 50, 60. She was 25 years past the menopause. God said, I'm going, now watch, now Abraham, if you'll do this, if you'll do that, no, there were no ifs to it. God said, I have. Amen. God, man, uh, God made a covenant with the man, and every time that God makes a covenant with a man, man can't keep his covenant. Man breaks it. He tried it with Adam. Adam broke it. Every time he makes a covenant, he made it with Israel through the law. They broke it. No man can keep it. So God so determined to save the people, he made this covenant. He was determined to save man, so he made it unconditionally. He swore by himself. Not having man to do anything into it. Amen. What I'm trying to do is get to the Pentecostal people to let them realize who they are. If you only knew who you was tonight, there comes such a spontaneous world of faith to you, so there wouldn't be a sick person to be no need to have in a prayer line. If the people at you realize who they are, that's the only way. You can do it. How do you think it is in foreign nations walking against demons and powers and everything? You have to know where you're standing. Satan don't care how loud you holler. Satan don't care how much you jump up and down. Satan will lay right there, but he has to recognize faith. It'll move him every time. So that's where it is today. The church has got the blessing, but they don't know it. Now, God calling, and he gave the covenant to Abraham. Abraham separated himself from his people and went over into a strange land, cross Euphrates. I believe they were given the word Hebrew, and he crossed over, separated himself to walk in a strange land among strange people, speaking strange languages. That's all he does yet. You know, come out from among your associates, walk amongst strangers that you used to not know, people who's estranged to you, yet you find out they're precious citizens of the kingdom of God. Notice, Abraham. After coming out, now he went and told Sarah, Sarah, they've probably been married since they were young folks. Abraham, say, 27, her 17, something like that. They'd been married, but Sarah was barren. All through their young married life, no children. Here they are getting well stricken in age. And now God comes down and said that he was going to make his covenant and he was going to give Abraham a child by Sarah. The impossibles, he was going to do it. Now, you know people around the country there thought Abraham had lost his mind because he believed God. Well, now, I can imagine going out and buying up all the bird eye and get the pins ready and everything, just going to have the baby. 
No matter how impossible it looked, God said so, and Abraham believed God. It was imputed unto him for righteousness. Wow. I can imagine Abraham thinking it's going to come right away, like people who's prayed for it think, uh-oh, it'll happen right now. Not every time. Not every time. I have to see after the first few days, Abraham says, sir, how do you feel, honey? No different. Praise God, we're going to have it anyhow. We're going to have it anyhow. Second month passed, how you feeling, honey? No different. Glory to God, we're going to have it anyhow. How do you know? God said so. That's right. And notice, the Bible said Abraham, instead of getting weak, if you went was prayed for one night and the next morning said, well, I ain't no better. Well, I guess there's nothing to it. Oh, what a poor son of Abraham you are. That's right. Yes. Not much of a son or daughter of Abraham. Abraham received the promise and believed it. And as it lingered, he got stronger and stronger. It's going to be more of a miracle all the time. After 25 years, the baby hadn't come yet, and he still believed it. Amen. Oh, my. Why? God said so. God's got to keep his word. He's got to keep it. He kept his word. Then, years passed. Abraham and Sarah still believing he's going to have a baby. Well, God said so. God said, I have saved you, Abraham, and I've saved your seed after you. Not only Abraham, but Abraham's seed also. Now, I want you to know what Abraham's seed is. Abraham's seed is not seed. It's the seed of Abraham, which come through Isaac. Isaac knew Christ. And we, we be dead in Christ, take on Abraham's seed and are heirs according to the promise. How's the covenant given? Unconditional. Everyone that God calls, chooses, elects, that person has the same promise Abraham has. Amen. Brother, if I don't shake the suck tag through the devil's eyes, I don't know what to do. You're Abraham's seed. Not what you do, what God has done for you. You're an Abraham seed. Ab- and God, now Abraham wanted all a confirmation that he would keep this. Oh, I want you to notice this. Such a lovely, so beautiful. He said, how will I know these things, Lord? See that I'm old, nearly a hundred years old now. And how am I going to know that I, you're going to keep this with me? How do I know this covenant is going to be kept? Here's what he said. Listen now. He said, come out here, Abraham, and I'm going to show you what I'm going to do. And Abraham took a, a heifer of three years old. He took a goat of three years old. He took a ram of three years old. And he split them in half and laid them out on the bank. And then he took two turtle, turtle doves, or a turtle dove and a pigeon, and he didn't separate those. Oh, my. I wish we had time to get this really for just a few more minutes, but we can't. Got to hurry. We will sometime. Notice, he said now to this, why didn't he separate those? I wish I had time to go in and show you how law and grace was different and so forth. But when it comes to the turtle doves or pigeons, and any Bible reader knows that that was a cleansing for healing. That was a healing, which in these covenants here are separated, but divine healing has always been in every covenant at every time. They're unseparated. They laid in there, the pigeon and the turtle dove. These other laws and grace and so forth was divided, but this turtle dove and pigeon was not divided. They were laid in whole. Then notice, oh, I want you to get this. Oh, I feel real religious about this time. I believe a Baptist could shout once in a while if he got down to a place where he had to. <laughs> Amen. Notice. Then, at that time, God said, Abraham, I'm going to show you how I'm going to do this. And he swore by it, swore that he would do it. Then, watch what he did. He went out there and told Abraham, he put him to sleep. And Abraham watched the birds first, off of the sacrifices, until the sun went down. He drove the birds off the sacrifice. Then when the sun went down, now watch, God telling Abraham now, I'm going to show you, Abraham, 
that you or your seat as yet hasn't got one thing to do with this. I'm doing this myself by election. Oh, my. Get it, Pentecostal people. Here's the foundation of grace. Here's the foundation of faith and why we can have faith and unmistakable faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Watch close now. Then, when he came down, the Holy Spirit to talk to Abraham in the garden, out there where he was laying on the hill, he put Abraham to sleep. Now, Abraham, you haven't got one thing to do. All right, you lay here now. And Abraham went to sleep. You're out of the picture. And the next thing, now what's God going to do? He's confirming and giving an evidence close. He's giving an evidence or proof to Abraham how he's going to do this. Amen. Amen. How he's going to do it. Listen, if you want to be healed, how he's going to do this. Then, Abraham, I'm shutting you out of the picture. I'm putting you to sleep. Then before Abraham come a black thickness. After every sinner deserves to go to hell. Blackness. Then after that, a smoking, burning furnace. Every sinner deserving. Abraham, that's what you deserve. But beyond that, one a little white light. That little white light went right between those pieces of sacrifice. Right back and forth, the white light moving, showing, making a confirmation, showing to Abraham what he would do someday through his seed, Isaac, bringing on Christ for the supreme sacrifice. Now, a covenant has always been a strange thing. In China, when they make a covenant one with another, they take a little salt and throw it on each other. That's a covenant. When we make a covenant, with one another, we say, shake hands, put her here. That's a covenant. But in the Eastern Orients, during this time, when they made a covenant, they went and killed a beast. They split it open, and they stood between this dead beast, and they wrote out their covenant. I hear, hereby say that a certain, certain thing, and write the covenant, the agreement. Then they take this agreement, and they tear it to peace. One piece is given to one man and one to the other. And when this contract, they take an oath over this dead beast, let my body be as this dead beast if I don't keep this covenant. Watch! God was then in spirit. How could God be tore apart? But one day God was made flesh and dwelt among us the Lord Jesus Christ, the Emmanuel. And then, there, at Calvary, the covenant God wrote with us, he took the Christ to Calvary and tore him apart, soul and body. And he took his body up to sit at the right hand of his majesty and sent the soul back here of the Spirit on earth to make a covenant to carry out the gospel and the same dovetail power that Jesus Christ had. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the church is given the covenant. The covenant is the baptism of the Holy Ghost, which is the seed of Abraham. Bringing to us and then God making this covenant that every man that's called into the grace of God by the Holy Ghost has the same promise that Abraham had of eternal life. Oh, Terry, look, now you can't have a piece of paper that just impersonates it. You can't have a piece of paper that makes it something like it. It's got to be the same piece of paper and the same spirit that was on Jesus Christ has come back on his church doing the same signs, the same wonders, the same Holy Ghost, the same power. It's the covenant that God has given to them. And Jesus died there in the evening time when the sun was going down. 
confirming this covenant. And the Holy Ghost is on the church tonight, leading the church just like that he was sure when he was leading Christ. The same way the same ministry Christ has is in his church tonight. Same signs, same wonders, same spirit, same kind of works that Jesus did here on earth. The church has to do the same thing. If it's not, it is not the seed of Abraham. It's not the church of Jesus Christ. So Pentecostal people, do you see that that's you? These others can't believe in that. They have nothing in them to believe with. But the trouble of it is, you've got it and don't know it. If the devil, if you can get it, he can hide it from you and let, not let you know you've got it, he's got you licked. See? You can't fail. There's no way of failing. You're Abraham's seed. God has sworn with an oath it take you in. Amen. There you are. He's made his covenant. Hallelujah! Jesus Christ is his covenant. And he tore him apart at Calvary, received the body up, and sent the Holy Ghost back. And when the resurrection comes, the same spirit that was in Jesus Christ is the only thing that will raise this body up to go meet death and death. To make them husband and wife. You see what I mean? The bride, it's the covenant people. Unconditionally, God calls you out of the world, gave you the Holy Ghost, the seed of Abraham. You are tonight with a blessed promise. Amen. Wow. If you, then if you're Abraham's seed, you have this promise in you. You believe God regardless of what takes place. The Holy Ghost makes you believe it anyhow. See? The Spirit was up on Christ. It's up on the church. Because there's the bride and the groom. They've taken the Spirit a little while in the world, see if no more, yet you'll see me, for I'll be with you even in you to the end of the world. The Spirit and the body is taken up. Now the same Spirit was on Christ has to be in you or it won't compare with this covenant. See what I mean? <laughs> then aren't you happy tonight? that you're baptized into the church of the firstborn of the living God. That the very same Spirit that was in Christ is in the church tonight. And you are a part of it by the Holy Ghost. Being dead in Christ, take on Abraham's seed and her heirs according to the promise. What are we scared about? All devils in hell couldn't shake you. Nothing can shake you. We receive a kingdom that cannot be moved. Oh, my. Set yourself on these thoughts one time and think of what God has said. Not your circumstance, not your, nothing else but what God has said. Abraham didn't look at anything, the circumstances. He didn't think about them. He never thought about how old Sarah was and how old he was getting. He just remembered God said so. And that same spirit is up on we, the children of Abraham, making us think the same thing. How are you going to receive the Holy Ghost? How's the man going to speak a new tongue? How's the man going to do this? The natural mind can't receive it. But the seed of Abraham, which is born again, and the seed of God, the Spirit of God, is in the seed of Abraham, which makes him believe that because God in him pushes right out and makes him, don't look at these things, he's got another sense. That's right. The sixth sense that he believes it, whether he sees it, tastes it, feels it, smells it, he believes it anyhow. That's right. That's right. Believes it anyhow. Then when he takes that, then he begins to water. When he begins to water, it begins to grow. And every seed of God will produce just what it said. Oh, will you spare, spare me just a few more minutes, <laughs> if you will? I, I just hate to butcher anything up like this, but look, just a moment. Abraham later on, he become a hundred. That's 25 years later. Well, still saying, I feel, Sarah, just the same. Well, hallelujah, you're going to have the baby. 100 years old. And he got stronger and stronger. Someone said, hey, Miss Jones, I thought you got healed when you was prayed for, when the pastor prayed for you. Well, glory to God, he healed me. That's it. That's the idea. Keep on believing it. You're the seed of Abraham. You will believe it that way. You can't help for believing it, then you. It's a nature. You have to believe it. Now, watch here. 
Now, first thing you know, I see when he's 90 and 9, God appears to him to kind of confirm this thing. 17th chapter of, of Genesis. He appeared to him in the name of El Shaddai, which the El Shaddai is the Hebrew word, which means the breast or the breasted one, like the mother or a baby. You take a little baby and say, Abraham, I am El Shaddai, the Almighty God. Now, yet you're old, your strength's all gone, Sarah's womb is dead, she's 90. Little grandma right now, great, great, great grandma, 90 years old. She's all old. The people's laughing at you, making fun of you, but I am the breasted one. Like a mother to her sickly, fret baby. Now, when the little baby's all weak and run down, his strength's gone, the mother pulls it to her bosom, and he, the child nurses his strength from the mother. The mother's strength becomes the child's strength as he draws it from her. And so he said, now, Abraham, you're old, you're past the age, and Sarah's a past the age, but I have to bless her through you, so you just lean up on my bosom and just keep nursing. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'll give you your strength draw it out of me. Oh, my. Now, now watch. The breasted one. Not one, but two. He was wounded for our transgressions with his stripes for healed. Just turn your head if you need healing. Amen. See? I am the breasted God. That's what it means. In so many words, Abraham, I am the breasted God. Now, what I'll have to do, I'll, have, I'll give you eternal life by nursing from here. Now I'm going to do some divine healing in your body if you'll nurse from here. Amen. He's the same El Shaddai tonight. He changes not. And his covenant people has the same privilege to draw from the same resource that Tyler Abraham had to draw. Because God swore by the same covenant that he'd give us the promise. Oh, my. There you are. There's where my hope is built on. Nothing less but Jesus' blood and righteousness. And all around my place, he's all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock, I stand all other grounds and say you think. There you are. El Shaddai, the bosom, the breasted God. If you need salvation for your weak soul, draw from this side. If you need healing for your body, draw for this side. For my covenant was with Christ my son. And in there, he was wounded for your transgressions. And he was, by his stripes, you were healed. I am the Almighty. Just lean up here and go to drawing from their promises. Take them in your heart tonight and just start drawing from them. God, you promised it. Lord, tomorrow I don't care how you feel, what you look like, Lord, I'm drawing from that promise. Watch how strength begins to renew. How things begin to straighten up. How arms begin to move out. How eyes begin to brighten up. How hearts begin to beat normal. The breasted God. I'm drawing. Well, I don't care how I feel, what I look like, I'm drawing from that breast. Lord, you promised it. I'm the seed of Abraham. I am your child. And I'm drawing from this promise. It's thus saith the Lord. I believe you. Next day I'm sick or ever was. I'm still drawing. I stagger out of the promise of God you unbelief. But strong in peace, giving glory to God for the promise where he said it would be done. I know you're going to call me a holy roller, so you might as well get started now. Or I am. <laughs> That's right. Oh, if it takes the holy roller to get to heaven, then I'm a holy roller. Watch. I am the breasted one. Just draw nigh unto me. Now I want to give you some consolation right quick, if I can, in this, and show you now how God went. He didn't do no good as long as Lot hung around. <laughs> That's right. He had to get rid of Lot. He called him to separate him. Somebody took Lot with him. Lot was half backslidden all the time anyhow. So he went down there and... Sodom and Gomorrah, and after he got rid of Lot down there, all the city of Gomorrah, Sodom and Gomorrah was burnt up. Then God appeared to Abraham. He said, come out and look around and I'll see what you own. <laughs> Amen. Oh, I like that. 
Come out and look it over. Walk from the east to the west. It's all yours. You took your way with the Lord's despise to you. Now you're heir of all of it. Amen. All belongs to you now, Abraham. I give it to you. Unconditionally, don't deserve it, but I give it to you anyhow. Amen. Amen. Well, I don't deserve this, but I give it to me anyhow. So I'm going to walk east, north, west, and south and see what I own in the kingdom of God. All things are mine. Amen. Let's get up and walk around see how it looks. My, it feels good to take God by faith. Doctors say he can't get it well, but God said he could. So I just take it that way, and that's the way I believe it. Yes, sir. Well, my mom's still sicker than what's now. That'll make a difference. It makes me stronger believe. It'd be more of a miracle tomorrow night for me to get it. Amen. That's the Abraham's seed. Don't stagger at the promise of God. The doctor did all he could do. That's all he could do. But God hasn't done all he can do. Any job is too big for God. I can't tackle. So I just commit it to him and go on. Notice. Now, we'll have to hurry. I just keep thinking about that clock. And knowing you all have to go to Sunday school in the morning, listen. Just a moment. I want to give you a little consolation. You know, you believe the Bible's written, so you have to read between the lines, as I said? You read between the lines. Not the lines is right, but there's a between the lines. Now, Miss Branham's sitting back there looking at me. When she writes me a letter, when I'm overseas, she said, Dear Bill, I'm thinking of you tonight. I love you. And I'm sitting here with the children. Certainly miss you. Oh, that's what she's saying, but right in between there, I'm just thinking a whole lot more things she's thinking about. <laughs> I love her. She loves me, and I know how she writes. <laughs> See? So that's the affair between us. And when you come in love with God, you just read between the lines. See? He said, by his stripes you're healed. Yes, Lord, I know why. Because why? You couldn't turn your own children down. See? You've got sympathy for your children. No, I see. You just read between the lines. Now watch. Listen closely now and put on your jacket. I preached this about two years ago at a Bible conference one time. And brother, I'm telling you, my office is snowed over with letters and all the criticism you ever heard. And then I heard somebody picked it up and went and wrote a little book on it. <laughs> so it got scattered out somehow. But look, in a revelation, notice this. People begin to receive it a little more now. It begins to settle down and look at it better. See? Sometimes you kind of like a mule, you know, back up from the stall or don't look right. It's all right. Just keep looking at it a while. God will bring it to pass. He'll, he'll show you where it's at. Now, I want to give you some consolation, you dear old saints of the living God. I struggled a long time and now I'm getting broke down, getting old. Now I'm going to close just in about five minutes. Listen close now. Here was Abraham, 100 years old, Sarah, 90. God said, I'm still going to give you that baby. I remember my promise. You believed it all along, and I'm going to give it to you. Sarah laughed in the tent. The angel of the Lord knew what she talked about. That was the angel of the Lord. That was God himself. Abraham said it was. He had on clothes like a man, dust all over him, come from a far country. But Abraham saw God face to face there. Well, he went out, and look what he did. He eat meat. Abraham went and killed a calf, brought some butter out, and Sarah needed some bread and made some whole cakes, brought it out, and the Almighty, with dust on his clothes, sat down and eat a calf and drink and milk and eat hot cakes. That's the scripture, if you want to believe it. That's right. He just disappeared right before Abraham. Oh, my. <laughs> I felt where that went. <laughs> but it's the truth. And he said, Abraham, according to the time of life, I'm going to visit you. Sarah went on the inside. The angel said, or the Lord said, why'd you laugh, Sarah? She said, oh, I never laughed. Said, oh, yes, you did. <laughs> He's still the same tonight, isn't he? He knows what's in your heart and what's going on. Sure he does. Why'd you laugh? Wish we had time to dwell a little longer on these things. I'm... All right. Notice. I hear was Sarah. She got old, little grandma. And here's Abraham, long white beard, a hundred years old. Now to stop you off before you get started in your mind, the Bible said they were both well stricken in age. And years before this, Abraham fell on his face and laughed when he thought the very idea of him as old a man in his life gone like he was to ever have a child but Sarah. Is that right? Now, they were old, both of them. 
Now, we notice immediately after this when God made his covenant, or he showed Abraham. Now, this is not written right in the scripture, but read between the lines with me now. Now, when he showed Abraham what he was going to do, he made a manifestation of it to the people, to them. Now, watch. Now, he told them he's going to bless them. Now, ministers, I kind of hold your guns down for a minute, but notice. We know that God had to do something to the womb, anyhow, of Sarah, didn't he? She had been barren all these years, nearly a hundred years old and was barren. Well, in order, mixed audience, if you listen to your doctor, I'm your brother. In order to do something to make this, he had to, to recreate something in that woman's womb to make it fertile. Is that right? In order to do that, he had to stimulate her heart. Because she couldn't go and labor like that, a woman 100 years old. Is that right? Couldn't do it. All right, and another thing, what about the milk vein? God doesn't patch up anything. He made Sarah a new woman. He made her a young, beautiful woman again. And he made Abraham a young man again. He just turned him back to show what he's going to do in the rapture to us. Oh, you say, Brother Branham, ridiculous. All right, we'll follow him a minute. We know immediately after that, they took a little trip and went out to Greer. Is that right? Measured on your map, 300 and something miles by camel. What a trip for an old couple like that. Grandma here, a little stick, a little shawl. Here she comes, Abraham. 300 and something miles down to Greer. Is that right? The Bible said they went down there. And you know the strange thing it was? After little grandma and them coming down there, and great great grandpa Abraham. Long white beard, little grandma with this little shower. The king of Greer was looking for a sweetheart. All those beautiful women down there. But when he sees Sarah, he said, there's the one I want. <laughs> little grandma with a shawl over her shoulder. The most beautiful thing in the world. <laughs> Ridiculous nonsense. She was the little grandma. God turned her back to a young, beautiful woman again. That's what he's going to do to every one of you. In the rapture. Yes, sir. I can see her now, the king, looking all around where them pretty girls was. But when he seen Sarah, he said, there's the one I waited for. <laughs> Could you imagine little grandma? That's the one I waited for. No, she was a pretty girl. Turned back to around 25 years old, something like that. Abraham, a young, sturdy man again. God told him what he, he showed him what he was going to do. What the covenant is with you, what he done to Sarah and Abraham, he's going to do with you, grandmother, and you, grandfather. The same thing. Now watch. This king of Greer fell, fell in love with her. And Abraham lied. Said, that's, that, that, that's my sister. <laughs> this is going to shock holiness, people. <laughs> Said, that's my sister. And the king took her over and and he was going to marry her, and he got her over there and fixed her all up, perhaps, and put all the paint on her, whatever it was that the others did. He was king. He'd do what he wanted to. And uh, first thing you know, he might have manicured her hair, you know, or whatever you call that stuff you do on it, and fixed her all up. He's going to marry her. He's, she is a good Holy Ghost woman, so she didn't use that stuff. See? So he had to fix her all up, so he wanted to marry her his way. So you find out that night after he took his bath and laid and stretched his big feet out in the bed like that, he said, oh, my son, Lord, I'm so happy you give me this pretty girl. He heard all the time of the fact that another man's wife. And while he was laying there, now we'll remember, he was a righteous man. And so while he went to sleep, the Lord come to him and said, you're just as good as a dead man. Why? He said, Lord, why am I as good as a dead man? He said, well, you got another man's wife out there. See God in his sovereign grace protecting that stream of blood which comes Jesus? That's right. God will do it. Don't you worry. He'll take care of the rest of it. You just let him alone. Just commit yourself to him. He'll take care of the rest. So you're as good as a dead man. Why, he said, Lord, you know the integrity in my heart? Why, well, I said, you know that she told me that's my brother, and he told me that's my sister? He said, yeah, I know it. I know, I know the integrity of your heart, and that's the reason I kept you from sinning against me. Look, there's grace. I know you're a good man, a righteous man, and everything, but I'll not hear your prayer. Her husband is my prophet. 
think of it. A little liar backslid. You say, Brother Branham, I, I've done something the other day. I'm afraid the Lord won't heal me tonight. Oh, yes, you will. You get scared. If you're a Christian, you just have to go repent for what you've done and go on. See? <laughs> That's right. You say, well, I'll backslid. It don't make any difference. Repent and go on. See? You're scared. The first little thing comes along, you turn your head one way, you think God's going to condemn you. Repent! So, get right. You say, well, I... Now look, there was Abraham, and anyone knows that God told Abraham not to leave Palestine. And any time that a person disobeys God, he backslides. Is that right? And because of drought come on, Abraham, instead of standing facing the music, he went and done exactly what God told him not to do. So if you do what God tells you not to do, you're backslid. So Abraham was sitting out there backslid and telling a lie. But God couldn't turn his child down. He'd give him the promise unconditionally. He said, that's my prophet. You take his wife back and restore him. If don't, you're as good as a dead man. And let him pray for you. Who? Hallelujah. Who? Not that holier than I are, but my prophet sitting out there. I'll hear his prayer. Hallelujah. There's the grace of God to the Holy Ghost Church and you don't recognize it. Amen. The same thing that Hiram prophet Balaam seen when he looked down in Israel and he thought surely a, a holy God would curse the people that had lived with their mothers and all the things they had did, the honorary vulgar stuff, but he failed to see that smitten rock and that brass serpent go before Israel Amen. making atonement. That's what's the matter tonight. The people look down and say, Pentecost did this and Pentecost did that, and they're this way and that way. They fail to see the smitten rock, Jesus Christ, going before them in the power of the resurrection of the Holy Ghost. It's still the covenant people. I know they talk about it. They say, this preacher ran off of this man's wife, but over there ranks that did the same thing. Don't tell me I'll come out of it. I know it. They just got a lot of prestige to smother it down. You have to stand and bear it. <laughs> That's right. But if you've got the Holy Ghost, you're God's child, you're Abraham's seed. You've got an unconditional covenant written in your heart by God Almighty himself. Who can't take it back? Amen. He swore that he wouldn't do it. Hallelujah. Every promise in the Bible is mine. Every chapter, every verse, every line. I am trusting in his love divine. Every promise in the book is mine. God's children, unconditionally, you don't deserve your healing tonight. There's not a one of us in here deserves to even hear the gospel. There's not a one of you deserves the grace of Jesus Christ. None of us. We're all all together. But God, by grace, has did it anyhow. That's right. There's none of you deserve your healing. Every one of you ought to die. Me too. All of us. We're not deserved to live on the earth. That's right. We're not deserving to look at God's creation. But God has promised us, and he cannot lie. He swore that he would do it. Healing belongs to us. Amen. Salvation belongs to us. The Holy Ghost belongs to us. Heaven belongs to us. Now we're the sons of God. Now we're studying the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. There's nothing can harm us. The same God was watching Abraham and his mistakes. God made Abraham pay for it. Don't you think he got by with it? But God didn't cast Abraham out. He just made Abraham repent for it. Do you think you're not worthy to be healed tonight? That's the whole right now. The reason I'm saying this is because I know what you're thinking. That's the reason I do it in the night time. Find the way my, the spirit in the church is moving. Some say, well, I, I'm just not worthy. I guess maybe I've done this. Get that out of your mind. Sure you're not, and you'll never be, but Jesus is. Yeah. And he's the one who gave it to you. He's the one who paid the price. He whosoever will let him come and drink freely from the fountain of the water of life. Life. God bless you. Oh, I hate to butcher anything up like that, but I hope you get what I mean. God has made an unconditional covenant. He swore by the death of Jesus Christ. He sent the Holy Ghost back upon you to be a confirmation that the covenant is made with you. Brother. I don't want the devil to rob you out of that. Don't think I'm crazy. I guess I may be, but let me alone. I'm happy crazy then. Look, let me tell you something. 
I'd rather be this way than the way I used to be. Listen, you are the covenant people of God. God tore Christ apart at Calvary, making the covenant, swearing by himself, and he took the body up into heaven, which will return someday. But the spirit he gave back to lead the church. The same life that was in Christ Jesus is in the church tonight by the Holy Ghost doing and acting and performing the same things he did when he was here on earth. You've received it. You've got the covenant. It's written to you, swore by God. You can't fail. That makes the devil mad. Sure does. When you realize who you are, don't fear about the child, sister. God has made it so. Don't fear about the baby, sister. Don't do that. Just say, God, I now accept that. It's my personal property. I am a believer. I fill out this check and say, in Jesus' name, I accept that. That's all. Then the devil say, well, you're no better, but glory to God, I got it. Anyhow, <laughs> Abraham, tomorrow, how are you feeling? Well, you don't feel any different, but praise God, and we're having it anyhow. God said so. That's right. How do you know? I've got the covenant. Now, the covenant people, he said this, whatsoever things you desire, the Christian, when you pray, believe you receive it, just hold right on to it. It'll be given to you. Is that right? It'll be given. Just hold right on to it. Because God has swore that he would do it. I'm here in a confirmation. I'm going away, going back to the Father, and that the Holy Ghost will come. And he will confirm everything I've said. He'll be with you. He'll continue this ministry on until I return again. And here we are sitting in the building tonight, feeling the same Holy Ghost that they fell on the Lord Pentecost, the same Holy Spirit that led Abraham, the same Holy Ghost that performed the miracles in the early church, the same signs and wonders, the same baptism, the same results. What we got to worry about? God swore that he'd do it. Can't lose. Can't lose. God said so. Don't make any of what anybody else said. God said so. God bless you. Our Heavenly Father, we thank thee tonight because that you were so mindful of us that you gave us this covenant with Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Oh, Father, let me someday have the way or the means that I could explain what I feel in my heart. I pray that you'll bless this people here tonight. Lord God, let them not know that we're, we're not fanatics. Thou knowest that, Father, that we're not fanatics, yet we're classed that way. But we love you, and we believe you, and you are here confirming everything that we said is the truth. So give us courage tonight. Give faith. Give leadership, and let the Holy Spirit, the real divine leader of the New Testament, of the Holy Ghost Church, may he lead us all into that perfect faith, perfect love, one for another. Make us, Lord, so much in love that it will be hard to leave the building. Just tie our hearts together as one, and may we be in one accord, and may the same Holy Spirit that came on the day of Pentecost to go forth and to bring forth the seed of Abraham to the promise of God. May he do his work tonight here in this building. For I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. I'm so sorry to keep you that long, honest I am. But I just get started. I wish that I could have got an education or something to express myself the way that I, I feel it. I can't. I just can't, but my heart is a burning up with it. And I try to get it out. I slobber a whole lot. <laughs> I've been eating a lot of new grapes out of can, and that's what makes me slobber. So this is a pain and tension at that. So I love the Lord Jesus. I'm not here to be looked at. I'm here to represent my blessed Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not here with swelling words. I don't know any. I don't care to know any. I want to thank you. The biggest word that I know is J-E-S-U-S. That's, that's, that's right. And he's the one I love. And he's the one I desire to meet. He's the one that I desire to stand here and by his grace to represent him by way of divine power. 
If I could preach the gospel like some man, I would probably quit praying for the sick and preach the gospel. Being that I can't preach the gospel, then the only thing I can do is pray for the sick. That's my calling. That's what I do. May the Lord bless you now. We're going to call a prayer line. And now, tomorrow, you don't have to get up real early to go to work. You can, let's have a little prayer line, everybody. How many believe now that the Holy Spirit, the life of Jesus Christ, is here on earth calling the seed of Abraham to repentance? Let's see your... Then, if, if you are, you can't say, I can't say you are, and you can't say I am. I believe you are, and you believe I am. If we are, we've got an unconditional covenant. Is that right? That God, by grace, not because you say, well, Brother Branham, uh, I'll tell you, I, I, I paid a whole lot to a widow woman one time and give her some money. Uh, I know I'm saved. Uh -uh. I quit smoking, drinking, and that, that, that never was saved me. No, no. I got saved because, brother, I felt like shouting. I don't make me saved. I'm saved because I met God's conditions. <laughs> Look, I could quit drinking, smoking, gambling, everything like that, and still not be a Christian. Yes, sir. Look, I said not long ago, preaching in the Methodist church, I said, stealing is not a sin. Lying is not a sin. Committing adultery is not a sin. I couldn't get much farther than that to a little old Methodist mother sanctified, you know, raised up. She said, then, Reverend Branham, what do you call sin? I said, that's not sin. Unbelief is sin. That's the attribute of sin. You do that because you don't believe. The re of course, you don't believe on Jesus Christ. That makes you, then you can lie, steal. But when you're a believer, you don't do that. See? That's right. That's the reason that you do it is because you don't. Jesus said, He that heareth my words and believeth, believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. You might say you believe. You might try to impersonate a believer. But when you really believe, that settles it. That's all. Just two things, faith and unbelief. That's the only two senses that's left to the supernatural man. The natural man has five senses. The supernatural man, the spirit, has two senses. That's either faith or unbelief. You have to have one of them. If you're possessed with one tonight, you're a Christian. If you're possessed with the other, you're not a Christian. No matter if you've never done an evil thing in your life that you know of, you're still a sinner because you're born in sin. But no matter what you have done, you might be a prostitute on the street. If you believe in your heart Jesus Christ is the Son of God, repent and accept him as your Savior, you're a Christian and a believer. That's all. I'm two things. If you come up here tonight as a believer, you're going away healed. If you come as an unbeliever, you're going away the same way you come up. That's right. Is that right? Just have faith. All right. Where's Bill? What prayer cards you give out? I got all wound up here trying to talk. What? Olds. Five bars. You had olds. Was it olds last night? You sure that? Olds. One to hundred knows. All right, we've been calling about 15 at a time. And so maybe sometimes I get to that. Sometimes I have had time, I get 25 or 30 in a night. But it depends on how the visions work. If I just pass the people on through, I get the whole group. But when visions start, then one vision will take more out of you than two hours of hard preaching. That's right. You just don't know where you're at, or you just break into another world. And look at Daniel said he saw one vision, was troubled at his head for many days. He was bothered, he, you know. And look, when the many visions come, it's bound to make you weak. All right, old one to let's take the last part of them tonight. Uh, that would be from seven, eighty-five, eighty-five, ninety-nine, five hundred. The eighty-five. Who's got old eighty-five? See, if, raise up your hand, everybody, anybody has, oh, 85, the lady there? Come here, lady. 86, who has 86? All right, lady, come over here. 87, who has oh, 87? Raise up your hand. Oh, 87, is that, you have it back there, lady? No. Oh, 87, who has prayer card oh, 87? The lady here, all right. 88, who has 88? Would you raise your hand? Who has prayer card oh, 88? Lady, would you come here? 89, who has 89? Would you raise your hand? Somebody, prayer card 089, the lady back there, 
Oh, 89. Come up here, lady. That's right. 89. 90. Who has 090? Prayer card 090. With the man? All right. 90, 91. Who has 91? Raise up your hand. 91. 92. Who has 92? 92. 92. Prayer card 092. Would you raise up your hand? 092. 92. Let me speak again. Somebody speak in Spanish. 092. Prayer card 092. Would you raise up your hand? Somebody look at the other fellow next to you. Maybe he's dead. Look at the children here. Some, one of the ushers come here. Are you an usher, sir, sitting there? Look here and see if uh, uh, these prayer cards are, are the children. Is anyone else? Look, ask, look at the man's prayer card. 092. We're missing 092. All right, 93. Who has 93? Oh, 90, you 92 or 3? Three? 3, all right. 93. 94. 95. Oh, 95. 96. 97. 98. 99. 99. 100. All right. Line up here. Now, did we get old? What was that? Yes. All right. Brother Ballard. A Mrs. Mel Rosenack wanted at one of the hospitals immediately, but you call Broadway 62664. Mrs. Mel Rosenack, call Broadway 62664. Bow our head if that's an emergency. Let's bow our head. Heavenly Father, if your child is in here tonight and Satan is trying to do something evil, as your church, as the body of Jesus Christ who has power, to lose our divine on this earth. We now claim that, and Satan cannot rob us from it because it was given by sovereign grace. And we ask that the woman, that or the person that's in the hospital that's very sick or what's wrong, that the mercies of God will fall upon that person and Satan will be drove away and the person will be made well. And bless that one who is here that's listened to the message, and when they get there anointed with this spirit, I send it in the name of Jesus. Let them lay their hands up on the patient, and may the spirit of life turn to the patient, and they live. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Don't fear. Ever who you are, when you get there, lay your hand on the patient, and don't be afraid. Only believe. You shall see the glory of God. All right. Excuse me just a moment. Now, Christian friends, <clears throat> you're all praying with me now with one accord. This is so hard. It, it may seem strange, but to change from preaching or getting in there, now you've got to sweep back down to something else, to a divine gift. It's all of the Holy Spirit. One does this. One finger works this way, the ear, the nose, the eyes, all is a part of the body, but you're switching from one to another, you see. I wonder if we could now <clears throat> sing, only believe, or if the, the musicians will, if they'll play just a little bit. Thank you, Sister Kind. Now, <clears throat> mothers, keep your children close. There's epilepsy here tonight. That's the one thing it gets from me, is epilepsy. <clears throat> Now have faith. Believe me as I teach you of Jesus Christ. Paul said, Be ye followers of me as I am of Christ. Is that right? And if I tell you something, there might be men come through here. Everything drops through these cities, not only here but everywhere. They have all kinds of this, that, and the other. I know it, Christian friend. But that don't take away from the real. If a man speaks and God confirms what the man says, you haven't got any right to doubt him. But if the man speaks and God doesn't speak with him, then you've got a right to doubt the person, because that's just the man. And if I told you that I had powers to heal people, I'd be a liar. If I told you that I had any way at all of healing a person, I'd be a liar. But the only thing that I have is the gift of God, see? And that was given to me by grace, not for myself, but for you, see? And it's the divine gift. As far as seeing visions, my Bible in my hand, Almighty God who stands here now, knows that that's truth. God shows me vision. That's exactly the truth. But now to heal, 
I have no power. Nobody else does. There's no power in man to heal. The only thing we can do, we can pray, and prayer is the most forceful weapon that's ever put in the hands of anybody. So you pray with one accord now while we hum this song. Let's hum it one. See? Just the effects of that. I hope you don't believe I'd be telling you a lie. But the Holy Spirit's right here now, right? That's what's worried me all the time, keep me from speaking to people. I always thought it wouldn't shake back, but it is. waiting for them. And while I know that your spirit is here now, this lovely group of people's listening have been sitting here since four or five o'clock in the evening, tired, but yet they're waiting. The seed has been sowed. And now, Lord, while your spirit is on your servant, I lay my body across these handkerchiefs, and I ask the old God to be merciful to every one of them and heal them. And I know that the great St. Paul took from his body handkerchiefs or aprons. And we know we're not St. Paul, but it wasn't Paul, it was you, Father, the Lord Jesus, who came and performed this and helped the people by having faith in your servant. And they accepted Paul as your servant. And tonight, Lord, these who believe that I have told them the truth, confirm your word, Lord, so when they get this handkerchief, they'll know that it's you and not your servant. Grant it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, with perfect reverence, now in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, I take every spirit in the building under my control for the glory and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. How do you do? Um, I see you got one of the pictures. <laughs> well, that's very fine. I just want to speak with you a moment. And I suppose we're strangers to each other, so I don't know you. But our Lord knows you, and he knows me. And I, let's talk on the picture just a moment. If you, know. right. uh, you got the little story there how that happened right here. Yes, that was signed by George J. Lacey. One of the best on the research and fingerprints and things that I guess there is in the world. And um, that uh, little pillar of fire you see there, some time ago there's a miracle performed <clears throat> with that. A lady put it in a picture. Many of them put it in a frame, go to the 10 cent store. They put a little frame and put this little thing behind it if anybody asked about it. And she had it sitting on her, her desk at the hospital. And she was looking, not at me, of course, but at the pillar of fire there. And she claims, this is her testimony, the doctor give her up to die. She claimed that that pillar of fire come out of the picture and hung over her. And two days later, she was dismissed from the hospital and went home well. See, God just, she just, as, um, it was just her, her contact of that, you see. She just, she just looked at that and believed. Now, we know uh, to look at that any other way would be like idolatry. We wouldn't do that. And it's not the picture, it's what it represents. So you understand that. Yes. And uh, I hope that long time you'll have it and remember. Thank you. Thank you. And may God bless you. And may each time you look at it, you remember tonight at the platform that that same pillar of fire that's on that picture, you're standing right in its presence now. <laughs> and that is right. You're in his presence. Now, then if that pillar of me just a man, and you a woman, we've never met before or not. But if that if I told the truth now of Jesus Christ when he was your owner, he didn't claim to be a healer, you know. He was 
He only did as the Father would show him. You know that in the Scripture? You've been in the meetings before. Not in this one. But you have heard then that how when Jesus is here on earth, he said, It's not me that doeth the work. St. John 5, 19. He passed for the pool of Bethesda and all the crippled people there. He just healed one. He wasn't crippled, laying on a pallet. He went away and left the rest of these questions. He said, it's not me. I can do nothing but what I see the Father doing. Then he said, the things that I do shall you also promise in the church. Is that right? Well, then that's Jesus Christ, resurrection, the form of spirit here on earth today, performing the works that he did when he was in the body. Now, if, if he was standing here with these clothes on, he gave me. Now, as far as your healing, if you're sick, that's, I don't know. But if you're sick, he'd say, well, when I died for you, I healed you. Believe this? Then he'd tell you, just like the woman at the well, he'd say, uh, uh, you know what was wrong with you. You know where your trouble was. Well, then if he ascended up to heaven and his person of the Holy Spirit is here tonight, then promise me he would do this according to his word. And he could tell me this. And he, to do the same thing that he'd do if he's standing here. Is that right? Now you begin to realize that something's taking place in secret. That's it. Yes, ma'am. Your trouble, one thing, of course, is your eyes. Your eyes are going bad. Then you're extremely nervous. Isn't that right? Here's something else that I see that the outside world can't see, and that is you've got a tumor, and that tumor is on the left shoulder near the breast. Is that right? Go home now. You're going to get all right and be well in the name of the Lord Jesus. Just believe. Are, we're strangers, are we, lady? We are. We're strangers. But sitting down there in the audience, I've seen you were building up a faith. You was believing on what I said about the unconditional covenant of God. Now, if we're strangers and know not one another, but God knows both of us, he knows everything that you've ever done in your life. He knows everything that I've ever done in my life. And if you be uh, my, my sister, a believer, and, and believe that God will make you well and will help you, I believe with all my heart he will too. What do you think about this kind of religion? Sure you do. Yes. Uh, thank you, sister. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? All right. I'm going to, that the Holy Spirit will let me, you know what I was talking about then, of your own religion. All right. But do you, you if I be God's servant, then I, I'm truthful. Is that right? I'll be truthful. Then the Holy Spirit will confirm my word. You're suffering with a throat condition. Isn't that right? And you you haven't been able to swallow hard foods for a number of years. A much younger woman, I see you trying to get hard foods down. If God will let you eat, will you seek God till you receive the Holy Spirit? Be back. You will. A Catholic woman, you can go now. Read your supper. God bless you. Say, how do you know that? 
Well, I don't know it. It's him that knows those things. I know nothing, but he knows all things. Now, if you can only see that life following the woman, that same thing, I beg your pardon. Lady sitting next to her, their female trouble is so hard. Isn't that right, lady? She sat down next to you. She was so anointed. Just saying, you were healed with female trouble. You had female trouble, didn't you? All right, it's finished now. You can go home and be well too. God bless you. All right. I suppose you and I are strangers, are we, lady? We don't know each other. just to talk to you just a moment now. If we be strangers, the Lord, when he met the woman at the well, he began to speak to her. Is that right? Tell her about different things in her life and everything. Now, if we strangers never met on this earth before, only God could, well, he's the only one who could reveal those things. Is that right? To be perfect. See? To be perfectly, he's the only one that can do it. But now, if God would let me know what what you're here for, see, if you let me know what you're here for, then would you know it have come from some spiritual resource. It has to be spiritually divine to you, see. Well, then, if that be true, then would you accept it as Jesus Christ's spirit? Yeah. Yeah. You should. Yeah. Now, you all keep in one accord. You've got, some, you've got a battle of little unbelief fists around the wall tonight. Now, I want you to have faith, you see. It's a hard battle, you see. If you just remember, I'm trying to represent the Lord Jesus Christ to the people. And it, it just keeps going from me. And I'm, I look this way, sister. Now, I, in Jesus Christ's name, yes, there she is. You've, um, you had some trouble not long ago. You had a burn of some sort. That's been about six or seven years ago, in the year of about 46 or 47, and that was an acid burn. Is that right? And if you're having trouble with eating now, and you have a throat trouble, and your eye trouble, and you are a minister, and you've got papers, an ordination, papers from an organization. Is that right? You believe me to be his prophet? Yes. Then in the name of Jesus Christ, I resist this thing that would hurt you. God bless you. faith now. What is this? Jesus Christ, the seed of Abraham, that the Spirit was taken off of the body and brought back to the church. Just exactly what I've been preaching about. All right. How do you do? Do you believe me to be his servant? with all your heart. You are have an extreme nervous condition. Isn't that right? You got what it is, it's more like a mental nervousness. You get real gloomy. I see you beside yourself almost sometimes. Isn't that right? And you're you're some connection with your away from here or from away from no it's a, it's a daughter you got a girl that's away from here and she's at the california and she's anemia is that right go home send her your handkerchief and both of you be well in the name of the lord jesus Christ. let's say praise the lord
You with my picture in your hand there, you're believing, aren't you? If God will let me know what's wrong with you, accept your healing. You believe me to be God's prophet? You do. All right. You had a rupture, didn't you? All right. God bless you. May the Lord Jesus Christ make you ever with hope. That's very kind of you, lady, to pick up that picture for her and give it to her. Look over this way to me. Because you did that and done her a favor, I shall do you one. You're sitting there suffering, too. And watch your trouble. I see you have something that you shake a whole lot, and then it quits, and then you shake a whole lot and quit. Spasmodic palsy. You believe Jesus is going to make you well? You do. God bless you. Then go home. You'll never have it again. God bless you. Do you believe, lady, with all your heart? Now there's something. You're, uh, it's turning dark around where you're standing. You must be terribly sick. You're, you're a nervous case. Very nervous, and you got TB. You're too perfect. And the worst thing of all, you need Jesus Christ as your Savior, not a Christian. Is that right? Will you accept Him as your Savior now? He accepts you as His child and heals you of TB. In the name of Jesus Christ, I cast away the evil and send her home to get well as God's child in Jesus Christ's name. Your sins are forgiven you, lady. Some ministers baptize her. All right. Would you come? Let's say praise be to God. Let the Spirit of God work in you. How do you do it, sir? Do you believe me to be God's prophet? We are strangers, are we, sir? I don't know you. Never seen you in my life. Know nothing about you. Only God alone knows. Is that right? But th to do something for you, I couldn't. But as a divine gift and the anointing of the Holy Spirit by a divine gift which was sovereignly given at the hour of my birth, then your life could not be hid. For I take your spirit into my charge in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, you're, you're suffering, there's something wrong. It's in your ankle. And that's TB in the ankle. That's what the doctor said. Is that right? Say you are a Catholic. No, you was a Catholic. You just have come into this way. You're studying this type of religion. Isn't that right? You used to be a Catholic, and you just come into this just now. Is that right? That is right. Amen. Just a moment. So to strengthen your faith, you do as I tell you. Will you do it? By the way, they, your name is Michael. They call you Mike, don't they? And your last name's Jordan. Isn't that right? And don't you live about 718 Garfield Street? Go back up there and rejoice. <laughs> Jesus Christ has honored you, making you well. <laughs> you believe for your heart trouble, sister, you can be made well right now. You believe it? God bless you. You'll see you when you walk up there. Jesus Christ made you well. You believe, sir? While you were standing down there in a line a while ago, you thought strange when I turned around and looked at you, because when there was somebody said something here on the platform, when I mentioned to that man or the, somebody just a few minutes ago who had TV, you had a funny feeling, didn't you?
because you had TV at the same time. I felt the go from you, and I looked down, and I seen where it was at. I know just coming on in the line, so you were healed standing down there. You can go on your own. God bless you. Now I want to ask you something. When I was speaking to him, you had a real funny feeling, didn't you? That's when the TV left you, too. So you can go home and <laughs> Believe? Oh, my. This is it. There's when the King of Kings walks among his delegates. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. You believe, sir? You believe with all your heart? You don't get over that kidney trouble? You accept and be, be made well? Raise up your hand and say, I accept my healing. God bless you. Go and be made well through Jesus Christ's name. May it be so. A little lady sitting right back there has that on her head with that gallbladder trouble. Your heel, sister. Stand up. That's right. <laughs> your little friend there, she kind of liked that too. You lay your hand over her. She's got back trouble, hasn't she? There's something wrong with her back. Stay up. You can go home and be well too in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, do you want to go home and be way well? You want to deal with that arthritis? Raise your hands up like this. Dump your feet up and down. Go off the platform to be well in the name of Jesus. Come, sir. You believe me to be God's prophet with all your heart? Will you obey me as his servant? If God will let me know what's your trouble, then will you do as I tell you to do? Go eat you a nice big hamburger. You haven't had one in so long with that stomach trouble. You can go eat it now and be made well. In the name of Jesus Christ. Come. Come. Kidney trouble will follow you for years. Is that the truth? God, the Son of God, heals you and makes you well, and may you go and receive it in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Amen. Believe us now this? Oh, You don't have a prayer card, do you, sir? You don't. You don't have no prayer card. I keep seeing a hang over you. You don't get with that asthmatic condition? You believe God's going to make you well? Stand up on your feet, then. Right? This man, the one. That's it. God bless you. You don't need a prayer card. You need faith. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. There's a lady praying. A lady with a, sitting with her hand up, you with the white dress on there, touch her. She's praying. He heard your prayer then. Yes, ma'am. You had hemorrhoids and they've left you. God bless you. Isn't that right? Ray, wave your handkerchief if it's so. All right. Go home now. You're going to get over it. He heard you when you were praying. He turned my attention. I see what he's asking for. So you receive what you ask for. God bless you. Amen. See a poor woman sitting there suffering. She's got liver trouble and back trouble, stomach trouble, sitting right there. Isn't that right, lady? Been sitting seeing he's been robbing you for a long time, isn't it? Emptying the gall duck goes and makes sour and acid on the teeth. Is that right? Stand to your feet. Go home and be well. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Make you all have faith in God. I challenge. All right. Have faith. Just a moment. I feel the spirit moving somewhere. Said, Oh, here it is sitting here at the woman's desk. Bow your head. Everywhere. Somebody bring it over. Here. Oh, Jehovah, in the name of Jesus I come. This evil spirit death in the ears of this woman that caused her to walk before a vehicle to be killed or some evil thing. But he can't stand in your presence. 
You said when the deaf spirit went out of the man, he could hear. And the Lord, she's unprivileged to hear the gospel, perhaps. But thou can give her her hearing, so I condemn this evil spirit and cast this deaf spirit out of her. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, come out of her. Here she is, a deaf woman. Now listen. Amen. Amen. I love the Lord. Perfectly normal and well. He had a female trouble too. Is, is that right? It's causing a drainage, you see, from the bathroom. It was an abscess. But it's gone now. It's a home to be well. Jesus Christ be with you. Hallelujah. Praise be to the Lamb of God. Amen. Every person in here can be made well right now. Do you believe it? I can call another prayer line. I can do it. What's the use of it? Why not believe Jesus Christ right now? If Christ has told me, and I've told you what he said, and he's confirmed that I've told you the truth, what more do you need but to believe and accept what I've told you? Is that right? If every one of you will believe Jesus Christ to be the Son of God and pull from that breast of salvation over to the breast of healing and lay your head over on his bosom tonight and say, I accept you, Jesus, as my healer. You will get well. I don't care. What's wrong with you? Do you believe it? If God can cast an evil spirit out of person by person, can't he by prayer cast the spirit out of everything in here? Will he hear my voice from the platform? All right, lay your hands on one another while we have prayer. Oh, Jesus, my master, my Lord and God, I pray for this audience of people. That it's late, Lord, and we know that thou art here. And I pray that you will help everyone. And may your power come upon them. And out of Satan, in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of the people, lead them, and go from them, and may the power of the resurrected God of heaven, Jesus Christ, make everyone. 